If someone was able to ask God to mold the greatest prize fighter that you can possibly mold, it would be Sugar Ray Robinson. When you look at Muhammad Ali, you're looking at Sugar Ray. I mean, it was almost an identical picture the way he boxed and Sugar Ray boxed. Sugar Ray was somewhat of a mystery. He was very guarded. He didn't take people into his confidence. When he died, I said, I don't give a shit. There's no sense of putting on any act now and feel sorry for the son of a bitch because he's the most arrogant person you ever run into. Robinson, I believe, was the first black athlete who could be great and at the same time say, I'm cocky today. I don't like it that way. This is how I feel, and not be ridiculed for it. We should remember Ray Robinson, because he was the one perfect fighter. He was an American original, a genius at his art form. And there was a tragic dark side, as there are to almost all geniuses. My name is Sugar Ray Robinson. It wasn't always Sugar Ray Robinson. I was born Walker Smith, May 3rd, 1921. Ray was born in Georgia, and his family moved to Detroit, and they lived in an area called Black Bottom. And as Ray said, they called it Black because that's what we were, and Bottom because that's where we were at. He liked sports, and he would ride on the streetcar going down to Brewster Center. It's a place where the young fellows boxed, and that's where he met Joe Lewis. But he was so fascinated by this young man, Joe Lewis, you know, carried his bags home and all that. And then when he'd come home, he would do this uh, crazy shadow boxing. My mother didn't know what it was. She just thought he was crazy. Well, around election time, 1932, uh, Robinson's mother, who was only earning uh, $10 a week, decided it was worthwhile moving to New York for 15 bucks a week. And uh, they packed the whole family up, got on the bus, and went to New York. And they lived a hard life of a single mother. He would do things like shine shoes, dance in the street for pennies, do all sorts of odd jobs to make money just to make ends meet. And he got into boxing at the Salem Crescent Athletic Club with George Gainford as the trainer. But first he just made the trips with the boxers. And one night he was on a trip and they needed another fighter. So George Gainford would have all these cards for all his fighters, and he took a card out, and the card's name was Ray Robinson, who was really another fighter. And he gave the card to the guy we now call Ray, whose real name was Walker Smith, and said, well, you, you, you know, you're Ray Robinson tonight. So he won that fight, and then he won a couple more, and it turned out he was Ray Robinson forever after that. One of the newspaper men remarked to George Gainford, my manager, that he, I was a sweet fighter. And George replied, sweet as sugar. And since that time, Sugar Ray Robinson has been added. <laughs> His official amateur record is 85 straight wins, 69 knockouts, 40 in the first round. Now that is a phenomenal amateur record. He entered the Golden Gloves in 1939 as a 126-pound featherweight, winning that title. In the following year, he repeated winning a uh, gloves title, but in the lightweight division, 135 pounds, and shortly thereafter turned pro. His debut was in Madison Square Garden, which was very unusual for a rookie pro in his first fight. And he fought a guy named Jose Echeverria and knocked him out in the second round. And he won his first 40 fights and was an instant sensation. I mean, he just beat everybody. It was very hard to keep cool in Harlem during the summer, so uh, he liked to go to the swimming pool. And one day he saw a young lady with the prettiest pair of legs he's ever seen in his life. And uh, he wanted to get her attention, so the best thing he'd come up with was pushing her in the pool. 
he pushed me in the pool. <laughs> he said, if that girl passes up this way one more time, I'm going to throw her in this water. One thing led to another, and he discovered that she was a dancer. She had danced at the Cotton Club with Lena Horne, and uh, she played hard to get for a while, but eventually he won her over with his persistence. I finally told him, if you propose to me one more time and have me go and take that blood test, I'm going to be bloodless, because every time I turn around, you have me take the test. And there is no marriage, so if we are not married on the next one, I'm going to leave. He said, I want you to be with me. I want you to be able to come to camp and spend time with me. And then they got married. Mrs. Robinson, uh, Ray says he wants to be babied. Uh, what do you plan to do about that? As much as I can and as often as I can. And cook his favorite food and so of forth? Of course. The best food, the best of everything for this sugar daddy. <laughs> Robinson, early in his career, was so good that he was running out of welterweight challenges. And uh, in order to get opponents, he would go into the next division. And one of the fighters he faced was the Bronx Bull, Jake LaMotta. Sugar Ray's first fight with Jake LaMotta was in late 1942 in New York City. Sugar Ray won in 10 rounds. He was offered a rematch with LaMotta in Detroit. LaMotta upset Robinson. Now keep in mind, LaMotta might have had 19 pounds on him. Well, naturally, he wanted a rematch, but he took a tune-up fight before the rematch. Two weeks after fighting LaMotta, he beats Jackie Wilson. One week after the Wilson fight, he fights LaMotta again and defeats LaMotta. Three fights within 21 days and two within eight days. The great tragedy is that none of his great fights in his prime were ever filmed. We will never see this guy at his absolute peak where he can knock you out with one punch with either hand. It's like not having the Sinatra recordings from the 50s. Uh, there's like, we can only imagine it from the old faded newspaper clips. From the time he lost the first fight to LaMotta in 1943 to 1951, that eight year time span, he went undefeated in 93 professional fights. This is a phenomenal streak. He was a tremendous puncher with either hand. Knock you dead puncher. Knock you dead. And a terrific finisher. He could knock you out going backwards. He could knock you out going forward. And that's why people remember him now as the greatest fighter we've ever had pound for pound. His use of rhythm, his timing, his footwork. Ray Robinson was the greatest combination of speed and power that ever came together in one fighter. And he had a sense of strategy, too, the overall fight. He knew where it was going and how to bide his time and what to deal with in the early rounds in order to accomplish this in the late rounds. This man was the ultimate warrior in the ring. He was the ultimate dispatcher of a foe. He was a, a distance fighter, an in fighter, very scientific, beautiful to see. And he made this brutal, uncivilized, barbaric sport, balletic. Ray Robinson was the perfect fighter because he had no weakness. He had one of the greatest chins of all time. He was never really knocked out in a 25-year career. Another special thing about Robinson, how many times he was able to get off the floor to win. He always rose to the occasion. Don't give him a rematch. Because once you beat him that way, you'd be sure that the next time he'd adjust and he'd know what to do. Nobody beat Ray twice until he was 40 years old. His intelligence, his versatility, and his will to win were the reason he won all those rematches. He created a new place for the imagination of a fighter, the way Louis Armstrong or Frank Sinatra or Marlon Brando opened a new room in their art form. The, the analogy is close, uh, if I say Shakespeare, only because um, if you said, like Charlie Parker or something, who came along and truly revolutionized jazz, it wasn't that after Ray Robinson Every boxer, like after Charlie Parker, every saxophone player played Charlie Parker. 
whereas with Ray Robinson, it was more like suddenly there came along someone who was just sort of up here. Muhammad Ali was greatly influenced by Ray Robinson um, and would freely admit that. Muhammad Ali is an homage to Ray Robinson. Watching Ali fight, you saw someone aspiring to be Ray Robinson. He was the heavyweight Sugar Ray Robinson. Muhammad started wearing, you know, the same kind of stuff, and he wanted to dance like, uh, like Sugar Ray. And he would say it a lot when he's training. This is where Sugar Ray do it, you know, and he'd go for that body thing. A few weeks after the third fight with Lamont, he was inducted into the Army. He was assigned to the Joe Lewis Troop, which was a group of boxers headed, of course, by the heavyweight champion that toured around Army bases in the United States trying to foster good relationships between the black and the white troops. But obviously down south they had a different ideal of what was a good relationship because uh, when they got to Mississippi, Ray discovered that the black troops were not allowed to come to see the exhibition. So what he did is he confronted the general at the post and said if there weren't any black troops there, there wouldn't be any exhibition. So a quick call to the War Department, and that was another victory for Ray Robinson. The Army decided to send the group overseas. They were having great racial problems, uh, particularly in, in England. And uh, Mr. Robinson decided that was not for him. So when the group left the port of embarkation, Ray was among those missing. He was soon going to be shipped out to Europe, but uh, Robinson didn't want to go. He was informed that if he did not follow orders, he could be court-martialed and punished. What eventually happened is Ray Robinson claimed to have fallen down the stairs. Ray's story was that he tripped, fell downstairs, had amnesia, woke up in, a, in an army hospital in Staten Island, and that led to his discharge. Now, that has always been Ray's story. Not everyone agrees with that story. Dan Parker in the Daily Mirror wrote that Ray had, in a sense, jumped ship, and that became the popular acceptance of what happened. Ray was honorably discharged, which is a point that he always bought up whenever his military career was questioned. But there is definitely some question there as exactly what happened. When Ray was discharged from the Army, he had been widely recognized as the best welterweight in the world uh, for a long time, but he couldn't get a title shot. And basically, I think the reason he couldn't get a title shot is that, quote unquote, he would have darkened the division. He would have been a black fighter who could have dominated all the white welterweights, and that's not really what sold a lot of tickets. Eventually, it became obvious that Ray Robinson was getting the shaft, and the public pressure built and eventually he was allowed to fight Tommy Bell for the vacant title. During the fight, Bell, in fact, knocked him down, knocked Ray right on his nose. But Ray got up and won the decision, and now he was the welterweight champion, and he kept going from there. Six years after turning pro, Ray is finally the world champion in 1946. From there on, the problem was finding suitable challengers. Jimmy Doyle was a very good fighter out of Cleveland, and it was a big fight in Cleveland because Doyle was a big draw in Cleveland. The night before the fight with him, I, I dreamed in my sleep that I knocked him out and he died in the ring. And I got up that morning and I told the commission that I wasn't going to fight. Two religious men were brought in to speak to him and say, Ray, this is obviously just a dream. But it turned out he... It was a prescient dream because he killed Doyle with a single left hook. He, he knocked Doyle out and Doyle died. A few days later, there was a coroner's inquest. There were a lot of headlines. Robinson under probe and death of fighter. And the DA said to Robinson, when did you know you had him in trouble? And Ray says, when he signed the contract, I knew I had him in trouble. It's my business to have him in trouble. His mother was convinced for the rest of her life that uh, this had a profound impact on him as a fighter and that 
mentally he was uh, no longer the same. Ray uh, would say to her often, I didn't mean it, Ma. I didn't mean it. I think it's hard to overestimate the impact killing Jimmy Doyle had on Robinson. If he went into the Doyle fight with a reserve about boxing as an avocation, I think he came out of it really disliking it, knowing he was a genius at it, but not getting any pleasure out of it. You give me the impression that you rather enjoy your work, is that right? No, just the opposite, Ed. I've never enjoyed boxing. I, uh, I just, it's just a business with me, and I guess I just, I know I've never enjoyed it. He just did it for the money. That's what it Get you out of the situation that you're in. Stop your mother from working. Poverty. Better things of life. Well, that's what he did it for. When he went on his famous European tour in 1950, he took nine people with him and 53 pieces of luggage. And as he was boarding the Liberty, which was the name of the steamship that was to carry him to Europe, one of the stewards said, Ray Robinson and his entourage. And he thought, boy, that's a pretty neat word. So he started using it himself. Now, Robinson didn't tour like the average fighter because he wasn't the average fighter. He was boxing royalty, and he saw himself as a king. The entourage consisted of a chauffeur, uh, a valet, uh, his personal golf pro, a barber, even a court jester to keep him in a good mood. Ray, when he was in Europe on the tour, he had five fights in 29 days, and he won them all for them by knockout. He was paid $50,000 and he had to spend all $50,000 to subsidize his entourage. He loved people around him, and when they weren't there, he was depressed. When they were, of course, he was elated. I don't think that he was necessarily lonely. I think that the entourage gave a little bit more credence to his ego. And God, he had an ego. This guy was truly an artist. I mean, he was a, a true artist, and, and one always associates um, a vast menu of uh, tics and phobias and, and um, eccentricities with an artist. For example, he had a house in the Bronx. The most important part of that house was the wiring that he had so that he could hear Everything it went on in every room. That was Ray, just very, very unusual. I can't tell you how many meetings I went to with Ray on the 14th floor and the 12th floor where we walked because he wouldn't ride an elevator. He'd fight anybody. He'd get on an airplane. He would not ride in an elevator. And he called everybody by the nicknames. Never would call them by their name. My name was Nick, N-E-C-K. I had a skinny neck. My uh, sister's name was Lard, L-A-R-D, because she was fat. He always called me Henry, and my name is not Henry. George Gainford, who was his manager, he called him the Emperor, and he called me Sarge. That's the nickname he called me. He'd say, Sarge, go get this for me. You know, or go bring the car around the corner for me, Sarge. I'd never seen such a gorgeous car. It was pink with little, like, gold dots in it. What a car that was. And I said, I got to get me one of them. I saw him one night driving down Broadway, and he was waving, driving the car and waving uh, at 43rd Street and 44th Street, and people were screaming from the sidewalk at him. If that car moved anywhere on any avenue, everybody stopped. It stopped traffic. People stopped. They gaped and looked, and then everybody would say, Oh, that's Sugar Ray Robinson. That's Sugar Ray Robinson. After having five fights with Jake LaMotta, who was still the middleweight champion of the world in 1951, Ray signed a contract to fight Jake for the title. Going into the 1951 middleweight title fight with LaMotta, Robinson's record was 120 wins, one loss, and two draws. I don't think that record will ever be equal in the entire history of boxing. Ray decided that maybe he needed a little extra edge and he was going to try and psych out LaMotta. They like to get this raw beef 
you know, and I had this old, he had an old uh, orange squeezer. And the steak would go in there raw, and they would crush the steak. You'd squeeze it down with a glass there and drink the blood. And he had to drink that for stamina. During the contract signing luncheon, um, Ray had the waiter bring out a glass of blood, and he drained it right in front of Jake, who, like, you know, his eyeballs rolled back, and he got kind of nauseous, and then he offered one to Jake, but Jake would, really didn't want it. But he thought Ray was crazy. The match was finally made for uh, St. Valentine's Day, 1951. Robinson, brilliant strategist that he was, knew that LaMotta had trouble making the weight for this fight and decided to play the matador against the bull and he uh, made LaMotta work in those early rounds. By about the 10th, 11th round, LaMotta was pretty well spent and that's when Robinson turned it on. These are clean whistling shots, lefts and rights. How he can survive them, nobody knows. And Robinson stopped the indestructible Jake LaMotta and uh, that fight came to be known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And the new world middleweight boxing champion, Sugar Ray Robinson. Back in the 1950s, most if not all of boxing was controlled by organized crime. The mob ran it. Frankie Carbo, who had been a member of Murder Incorporated, was the brains behind it all. And he had henchmen like Blinky Palermo, who operated in Philadelphia, who helped keep everybody in line. I didn't realize that people could be so le easily intimidated. I didn't realize people could be killed so easily, or threatened to be beat up, and threatened to get their legs broken, and their arms broken. And these are things I heard about. We know from Robinson's own lips that several times gangsters went to him in this period and just said you know we don't want you to take a dive just carry this opponent or carry that opponent 10 rounds we'll just bet the fight goes the distance during Ray's training for the Lamotta fight he got a call one day from a man who identified himself as this is Mr. Gray now Mr. Gray uh, of course was Frankie Carbo his first words to Ray were I represent the bull well, the bull was Jake LaMotta, and uh, Carbo wanted him to set up to deal with LaMotta where LaMotta would win, Ray would win, and then there'd be a third fight that anybody could win. And uh, Ray just said, I'm sorry, but that's the way I, I don't do business that way. And that was the end of it. It was a pretty courageous thing for Ray to do at the time, considering that uh, Carbo was the biggest power in boxing. And uh, he got away with it. They didn't come after him at all. And I guess the reason was that even a man like Carbo had respect for such a wonderful fighter as Sugar Ray. I don't know all the answers, but I'm the greatest authority in the world on Sugar Ray Robinson. And I have some idea on just what he can do and what he can't do. He was a pioneer in what he did. He was his own man. I respect him from him. George Gainford was his manager, but Ray was his man. He always called the shots. He was like uh, Kurt Flood in baseball as it is to boxing. If the fight wasn't right, he wouldn't fight. Due to difficulties with the International Boxing Club and the television uh, people, we rescheduled it for December the 12th. If a promoter was promoting a Ray Robinson fight, he never really believed the fight was going to happen until Robinson was in the ring and they rang the bell. Because if he didn't feel right physically, he would pull out. If he wasn't satisfied with the financial negotiations, he might pull out. You never knew when Robinson was going to fight until he was in the ring. The effect Doyle's death had on him is what made him realize that every time he stepped into a ring, he had to be compensated. His opponent's life was at risk, and maybe his life was at risk. It's what made Robinson become the Kurt Flood of fighters. It made him be such a prick to negotiate with. It's what led him to demand a cut of the film money, a cut of the radio, a, a cut of the TV money to get the expenses up front, to renegotiate even after the contract is signed. In my entire career, and a lot of it is involved in the entertainment business, Ray is without a doubt the best negotiator I ever met. He was widely despised, but at the same time, while being an impossibly difficult and nasty uh, negotiator, he did benefits. 
Boxing's been very good to me, and I'm more than happy to do donate my entire purse to the Damon Runyon Cancer Fund. There are a lot of paradoxes about Ray Robinson, who he, he was just an incredibly complicated person. After winning the middleweight title in uh, early 1951, Ray decided he was entitled to a holiday, take another tour of Europe. We had eight weeks of fights. We went to Italy, Milano and Torino. We went to uh, Germany. Of course, we went to Paris, and I think Ray had a lot of little fun there, too. He was very popular with the women, and it's said that he left his legs in Paris. And then he was offered a match against Randy Turpin, who was the British Empire champion. He fought Turpin and, in a tremendous upset, was outpointed in 15 rounds. It was a shock to the boxing world. I had a very nice time in Europe. Very sorry that uh, I did not bring back the championship, but I promise you I'll do the best I can September the 12th to bring the middleweight championship back to America. In the summer of 1951, they fought a return fight in the polo grounds. If you want to see a great fighter or a great athlete, see him when he's losing and how he reacts to that. And Robinson was losing the fight on points. I can still see the pictures of the blood coming across his face. And Ruby Goldstein, who was the referee, walked over to Ray's corner at the end of the ninth round and said to Ray, Ray, your cut is very bad. I'm going to stop the fight. Ray said, give me another round. He said, I'll give you one more round. I said, what did you think about when you saw the um, cut, you know, the blood? He said, do or die. Ray started to throw punches from all angles and caught up the turf and knocked him out in the 10th round. The winner! I think in the overall career, that was probably his greatest night. Give me a big, give me one. Give Daddy a big kiss. You didn't have one. No. No. Sugar Ray was one of the first black fighters who was an entrepreneur. And this was completely unheard of at the time. And I'm sure that it uh, shook up the establishment a little bit. Well, he had the block between 123rd and 124th Street. He owned all the buildings on the block. There was a bar and grill, a real estate office, a boutique, and he had a barber shop. So he, he had the block sewed up, really. Sugar Race Club, I mean, uh, you almost had to have a pass to get in there. You know, it was the spot in Harlem. It was one of the highlights of Harlem during that time. He had great musicians in there, had great food, and he would be there. It was always a lot of fun there. Everybody came by to say, let's go to Sugar Ray's, you know. Frank Sinatra would stop by, Nat King Cole, Jackie Gleason, Lena Horne. I mean, this was a hot club in those years. I'm in very good condition. I'm very well inspired at this chance to gain the light heavyweight championship of the world. On June 25th, 1952, Robinson challenged Joey Maxim for the light heavyweight title. He had already won the welterweight championship and the middleweight championship. And uh, this was uh, unprecedented. Maxim, 173 pounds. Robinson, 157 and a half. A 15 and one half pound weight advantage for Maxim. The fight took place on one of the hottest nights ever in New York City. Under the strong ring lights, the temperature was 105 degrees. We were hollering and screaming, and he was beating Joey Maxson. By the 10th round, the referee, not the fighters, the referee collapsed and had to be escorted from the ring, replaced by another referee. Robinson began to noticeably show the effects of the heat. His legs began to get a bit shaky. In the 13th round, he missed a punch and fell flat on his face.
although way ahead in the scoring, he was unable to come out for the 14th round. If not for the heat, he would have easily walked away with the light heavyweight championship. People don't know how near dying Dad was. Dad's body was covered with blisters after that fight. He could not retain anything in his stomach for like two days. He was delirious and he was not well for at least six months. After the Joey Maxim fight, he decided that uh, what he would do was give up boxing and get a nightclub act together. I've gone into show business because dancing is something I've always loved. I was a writer on the Pat Boone show, and Sugar Ray was going to be a guest on the show. And he came on very, very confident that he could sing. He was quite a terrible singer. I remember him telling me that uh, this was just the beginning for him, and he planned to carry it further and even sing opera one day. When I walk through a jam, no one knows who I am. And you thought to yourself, this guy's got to be kidding. Sugar Ray Robinson, the Father's Day Committee is deeply honored to name you the Sports Father of 1952. Here's your medal and my heartiest congratulations. Oh, what kind of a father was Dad? Dad, oh, that's hard to say. I, it's like horrible. My dad was a dad to lots of children except his own. My brother and I, anything that we wanted to do, there was always the chauffeur or somebody to take us, not my dad. My uncle always liked my brother and I to be around him because, I mean, we were almost like his children, you know. Um, his real children weren't around him as much as my brother and I were. He had a hell of a temper. If he got angry, everybody was quiet and stayed out of his way. he give me a heck of a slap or a push if he thought I deserved one at that time. She did not know how to deal with his philandering. You know, she'd say, get those bitches out of here. If you went to Sugar Ray's, you'd always see the queens of the hop. You'd see the finest ladies in the world there because he attracted him. Dad would have three or four rooms in the Teresa Hotel where he would keep his girls. But any time there would be a situation where he would be caught in the act or near the act or after the act, there would be violence that would be precipitated by that. It was outrageous <laughs> the way he would haul off and slap me if he thought that I disapproved or was getting ready to leave in any way. He was going to straighten me right out. Dad came in the front door, threw the door open, and nailed my mom with a combination. I yelled, stop, from the top of the stairs. And he looked up at me with the strangest face. You know, it was like pure shock and terror, and turned around and left. We got into a heated argument, and he knocked me down. And I looked up at him, and I said, did that make you feel like the champion now? All that punishment to his body all that punishment to his psyche, all that punishment, he then had an opportunity to vent when he had a bad mood or when he felt pressured. At that moment in my father's life, what my father would do would be strike out. He's very, very uh, good to live with. He's kind, he's considerate, and uh, he will never share a problem with you. If there's anything that worries him, he keeps it to himself. So times like that he may be a little quiet but he's wonderful to live with it's real interesting to know that here's a woman that constructed the whole story of sugar ray robinson who he was the cavalier gentleman boxer you know which he I guess dad, dad was gentlemanly when he chose but when it came to you know he was as down and dirty as anybody else he was one of the most mixed-up individuals I've ever known. 
A psychiatrist would have had a field day with Ray. Du dual personality. Uh, Ray would be charming, gracious, and uh, one minute and the next minute uh, have a stiletto in your back. He danced for about a, a year or so until the novelty of seeing him wore off. He was not Fred Astaire. <laughs> While Ray was dancing, I think he was in Europe at the time, he learned that his businesses had really financially collapsed. There were a lot of paradoxes about how Ray dealt with and felt about money. He was sloppy and neglectful about his own fortune that he amassed. He let his businesses run down. He got in trouble with the IRS over taxes. The collapse of his financial empire is what forced his compelling comeback. It's common gossip when a fighter makes a return to the ring, that he's broke, desperately in need of finances. Well, that's somewhat true. I need a buck as well as anyone else, I guess. But at this stage, having been out almost three years and with only one tune-up fight, his timing wasn't down, uh, his conditioning wasn't fully there. It's strange to see Robinson take two, hoping to land one. We've never seen him do that. He wasn't quite ready for a fighter such as Tiger Jones. And at that point, even the close members of Ray's camp thought he was washed up, that he was through, that he'd never be able to regain the title again. Ray was not discouraged by the loss to Tiger Jones. Uh, perhaps the fact that he needed the money pushed him on as well. And he did eventually succeed in um, obtaining a title fight with Bobo Olson, who had the middleweight title at the time. How's the fight going to go? Well, I think the people will get a run for their money. See that? Always have when we fought. Gonna go 15 rounds? Won't go over that. Go <laughs> <laughs> right, Bobo? Right. Now at long range, Olsen's left goes to the head, he drives the right to the chin, and Olsen is down for right up the cut to the jaw. Olsen is down on his back, three, four, he's rolling on five, six, seven, it is going to be a knockout for Timber Ray Robinson. After knocking out Bobo Olsen and regaining the title, Ray felt vindicated. The newspaper guys didn't think he would win. Nobody thought he could win. So on the way back to the dressing room, Ray Robinson, who was always in control of his emotions, actually broke down and cried. There's a quirk in American hero worship that I think people love you more if you have been humbled once or twice, if you seem vulnerable, if you have a weakness. And I think the same thing is true of Robinson. After he lost a couple times, when he reached the level of being a mere mortal and not a god, then I think he became more and more popular. In January of 1957, Robinson defended against Gene Fulmer very strong, powerful man, uh, difficult to fight, awkward style. We had the first fight scheduled for the first part of December in 1956. And he postponed it a, another month because he had a sore toe or a bad elbow or something. Robinson lost a 15-round decision. And again, the sports obituaries were written. The return fight with Gene Fulmer four months later, I think is probably one of Robinson's greatest moments in the ring. First five rounds, I was ahead I, probably every round. He came back to the corner after the fourth round and said that he had had enough, that he was gonna decide to quit, and they talked him into coming out one more round. And that one round was the end of me. Robinson was over in the other corner jumping up and down. I told my manager, how come Robinson's doing exercise between rounds? And he said, he's not doing exercise between rounds. He just won. He said, they counted 10. That was the first time in my life that I'd ever been knocked out, and the last time. At the age of 37, he was on top of the world, middleweight champion once again. The animosity started 
In 1952, Sugar Ray pulls up his entourage, and I said to my wife, wait, I want to go up and shake hands with him and meet him and introduce myself. I said, I'm Carmen Basilio. I just fought Billy Graham last week. He gave me a brush off. I was embarrassed. I felt about this big. I said, I'm going to fight that son of a bitch one of these days and kick his ass. Well, it didn't happen until 1957, but I got at him. Sugar, uh, what do you think will prove to be Carmen's weaknesses in this fight? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, say, Carmen, would you mind telling me what's your weakness? <laughs> When we first started to negotiate for the first fight, he wanted 50% of the gate, he wanted me to take 10%. I said, no way. Finally, Robinson got 40%, and he gave me the 20%, and he got twice as much. Well, at this time, we're talking about the advent of theater television, closed-circuit television, and naturally, this was a great new source of income. And, uh, you know, Ray wanted a big chunk of that money and as a result there were always negotiation problems. One thing about this guy, he had guts. Now, in the 11th round, which was considered the round of the year, I hit him with, they say, 34 straight punches. They had him up against the ropes. And he come back that next round and kicked the hell out of me. Although it was close, it was a split decision. The winner and new middleweight champion of the world, Carmen Basilio. He felt he defeated Basilio. And there were many people who agreed with him. So, of course, a rematch was in order to settle the issue. And uh, that was scheduled for March 1958. He hit me in the eyebrow in the sixth round. My eyelid blew up and closed. It looked like a great big plum. About the 14th round, one of my managers says, we think we're going to stop the fight, because I couldn't see. And I said, if you stop this fight, you better be out of town before I get out of this ring. I said, you're not stopping this fight. Robinson outpointed Basilio. Again, a very close split decision. Any possibility that you may fight uh, Carmen Basilio again? Well, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, there's a tax. Uh, situation that has to be considered, and I have to follow the advice of my uh, accountants and my consultants. Around the time of the fights with Carmen Basilio, the IRS was putting tremendous uh, pressure on Ray. In fact, the first fight, they took his whole purse, which was about half a million dollars. Robinson and White, Pender and Black, and they collapse out on the apron. By 1960, Robinson's marvelous skills had eroded terribly. He was nowhere near the fighter he used to be, but he was still a good fighter compared to everybody else. He also had a lot of problems uh, financially, had a lot of problems emotionally. He'd met a, a woman in California, Millie, who would eventually become his wife. His marriage with Edna May was breaking up. He was going through a lot of turmoil. When Dad and Mom got divorced, she came to me and she said, I want you to know that I love you, Dad, but I really don't want to take any more beatings, and I'm tired of his messing around. Yeah, I missed him so much, and I said I'll regret it. I shouldn't have left him, but I did, and I never went back to him. Robinson was still a great attraction. He was offered a fight against a middleweight champion, Gene Fulmer, in December of 1960. They were scheduled to go on at 10 o'clock, and at 10 minutes to 10, somebody came in and said that Ray was still in the street clothes and he wasn't going to fight. I ran into the dressing room, and I said, what's the matter, Ray? What's happened? He said, I'm not getting paid the right amount of money. And I said, what do you mean you're not getting paid? You signed for $50,000. And Ray says, yeah, but for television to be shown in the United States only, and I hear it's being shown in England, and I want another $10,000, otherwise I don't go in the ring. And I think we argued for five minutes and lost the case, and Ray got into his boxing togs and walked out and fought a draw with Gene Fulmer. 
it's entirely conceivable that Robinson could have won that decision and won the middleweight title for a sixth time. In the rematch, Robinson was now going on 41 years old. The last fight I had with him, the day of the fight, he wasn't going to fight because the ring was too small, he thought. So the fellow that was promoting the fight decided that he would go down to the hardware store the next morning, get a tape measure, and have him cut a foot and a half out of the tape measure so that the ring would look longer than what it actually was. And Robinson seen the tape measure, so he said, OK, let's go. It didn't need necessarily be bigger. He just had to be bigger in his mind. It was a man who just couldn't accept the fact that his physical skills had eroded. Robinson just couldn't do it. Many people ask me, why do I keep fighting? Is it because I need the money? Yes, I need the money, but that isn't my main goal. I believe that I will emerge victoriously in another championship fight and retire as the middleweight champion of the world. Ray continued to box for the money, for small purses, maybe under $1,000, fighting in a bullring in Tijuana. This was almost a cliche of the washed up fighter. Finally, in November of 1965, he fought Joey Archer, number one middleweight contender. It was Robinson's last chance. If he could get by Joey Archer, he actually would have been considered for another title shot. Robinson got knocked down by Joey Archer, and Joey Archer couldn't break a potato chip with a punch. And I found myself sitting next to Miles Davis. And I remember Miles standing up, and there were tears welling in his face to have seen this, because I think he believed that Robinson was going to get knocked out. Robinson didn't get knocked out and went the 10 rounds and lost the decision. And uh, Robinson was lying on a table. And Miles leaned over and said, in that hoarse croak of a voice that Miles had, he said, um, Ray, you're packing it in. And Robinson nodded. He says, you're right. And that was the end of it. Madison Square Garden decided that uh, he really deserved a proper send-off. Ray donned his terry cloth robe one last time, got up in the ring, and said his farewells and left to a standing ovation. And then he and Millie went home to their new apartment, and when he walked into the apartment, he had this huge, big, world's greatest fighter trophy with him. And all that was in the apartment was a card table in the living room and an old wooden bed in the bedroom. That was all the furniture he had. And here was this magnificent trophy and really no place to put it. Probably one of the saddest things about Ray Robinson's life was that for a man who was very business conscious, drive such a hard deal, tried to establish businesses that would uh, make him comfortable in his retirement, uh, it didn't work out that way at all. The business things for him were like toys. He didn't want to be really involved to do any of the work or anything like that. That wasn't his thing. My uncle trusted a lot of people where they were supposed to be paying taxes, they were stealing money. I caught a bartender stealing, so I fired him. And of course, he hired him back. He sold the barber shop, and then he sold the bar. And we were all sad because the bar was a, a place where everybody rallied, you know. And in 1965, all of the businesses were gone, so he went to California. Roll it, please. He had bit parts in movies. Can I help you? Didn't you used to be Sugar Ray Robinson? <laughs> Still am. He lived with handouts from friends and celebrities. Sinatra had a deal with Anheuser-Busch, and all Sinatra said was, take some of my money, give it to Ray. And Ray used to get a check, monthly check from Anheuser-Busch. It was Sinatra's money that 
he just rerouted to Ray. He said, uh, I borrow five grand and I pay back three. Then I borrow three grand and I pay back two. And then usually something drops in. Ray Jr., he said that he had come out to spend time with his father and uh, that he was shunted aside by Millie Robinson. Well, Millie was always is extremely, extremely jealous and possessive. My mother had a hard time to talk to her own son by himself because Millie had to be in on everything that happened with brother. She did not want any of the family around him because she thought that we would get something from him. And it was so amazing to me to hear this man who knocked down everybody in the world tell me that he couldn't come spend a day on the beach walking with his grandson and me because his wife told him they had to go someplace else. I believe that I was blessed with the talent which helped to introduce me to people throughout the world for this reason that I'm what I'm doing now, helping children. Ray had this idea of starting a youth foundation. Well, the dream was to help children and keep them off the streets. It was a juvenile delinquency prevention program. It instilled uh, self-esteem programs. It had athletic programs. Ray, because of his charisma and the people who adored him, got a tremendous amount of funding for the foundation when it was practically impossible to get. Around that time, I began to see that Dad was a little bit different than Dad had always been. Ray would start forgetting a lot. He started doing some of the same things he had just done. He started getting nervous habits, um, slurring his speech a lot, um, moving a lot slower than Ray really would have been moving. We were very suspicious. We thought maybe he was smoking pot or something because his, just his general being changed and he started getting accusatory. He was accusing Millie of meeting a man in a purple suit at a motel. Then the man turned out to be Wayne Newton. And, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just getting more far-fetched all the time. And I made Ray go see my doctor. And the doctor diagnosed it as premature senility. And then it just kind of went downhill from there. He would sit there looking straight ahead, and Millie would bend down to him and say, Ray, Ray, Dave Anderson's here. Dave, say hello. And he would bright, his face would brighten. He'd stand up, he'd shake hands, sort of give you a little hug. And then he would sit down again and go right back into that glazed look. Sort of a droning sound came from his throat. Mm. Mm. It wasn't so much sad as it was revealing about life, fighters. This was the greatest fist fighter to ever live. So if this is what happens to him, this is what happens to them all. My mom and I had this conversation about him. I said, Donnie, I'm not going to see him again. Something's going to happen. He said, well, let's go. So we jumped on a plane, and we went out to see him in California. And um, we walked in the room, and he didn't even know who we were. He was uh, sitting up on the couch. And then my mother walked over him, and, and she grabbed his face and, and kissed him. And she said to him, uh, this is neck, this is neck. And he looked up, you know, with glazed eyes, and he said, neck. And he grabbed her, and then he looked over at me, and he said, Henry. And it was still the same nicknames, you know. I don't know how long it was after that. It must have been about two weeks or something, or a week, that uh, they said he was dead. Ray finally passed away in April of 1989. Dad had a thing he did when I was a little kid all the time. He'd always say to me, you know, if I was going somewhere, he'd say, you have any money? I'd say, no. He'd say, well, here's a little money for your pocket. You know, so he'd give me a couple of dollars. So when I got to the church and the body was in state, I walked in and I, uh, you know, said my farewells and uh, put a little couple of dollars in his breast pocket. I said, here, old buddy, there's uh, a little money for your pocket. And, uh, you know, that was my completion with Dad. I really, for years, had a lot of problems with Dad. But to say I don't miss him is is 
not possible. Uh, he's ever present in my life. And I do miss him because we had fun. Uh, his passing profoundly affected me. The business that Ray Robinson championed is a brutal, debilitating, ugly business. But he championed it beautifully. I have to put him in the uh, pantheon of pugilism. That's his place. The greatest pound for pound that I ever saw. And as a human being, he was a man wrestling with his own problems. Anybody can lead a life in which everything goes smoothly. What's much more interesting is the flaws. Mistakes will be made. It's a question of what you do after. His record at the end of his career was 175 victories, and he had 110 knockouts. I mean, that's twice as many knockouts as active fighters have fights these days. First of all, there will be no one who fights that many times. Second of all, there will be no one who wins that many times. And lastly, there will never be anybody that looks as good doing it. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions.